Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Life After the Navigator. Hello, mate. You're right. We got Joey Kramer, we got Tim, and we got Lisa Downs here. All to do a talk for you guys today, and we'll do a fan Q and A at the end, and you can all ask questions. Welcome. Oh. So how how are you guys all feeling this morning? Pardon me, coming through. <laughs> I have to do it every time. Anyway. Testing one, two, three. It worked. <laughs> all right. Hi, everybody. I know I can't do voices, so I'm in good company. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So um, you guys, last night, you went to the premiere of the documentary. I want to ask you guys first how that went. What was it like? It's the first time you saw it, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was the first time we saw it on a big screen. Yeah. Um, which was... Like in, in public. In, yeah, in, in public. Up first yeah, in a, in, a, um, in, in, in a theater. Um, uh, we released it during COVID and stuff, so it was kind of hard to, to do screenings. But it was incredible. Yeah, we had uh, some people come and... And uh, lots of support and uh, kind of, you know, lots of feels, the good, the chills and a few tears and good vibes all around. So it was, uh, it was incredible. I was, I was really, really grateful. Awesome. So what was the, was the obviously extra fans and stuff that, what was their response to it all? And what feedback did you guys get from it? It was, it, it's just nice when you put so much work into something, um, you know, cast and crew gave their time and Joey obviously shared his story and it's so personal and it's not an easy thing to do and then as a filmmaker you're putting like every like blood sweat and tears for however many years into something so it's nice even just to have people there who want to give their time to watch it yeah. um but also they like when they start to connect with the message that you were hoping came across mm. with you know we have people afterwards say what they had been through and seeing other people come back out the other side and how they do it and it's really inspiring and so that's really nice to know that what we wanted to come across is actually like coming across and then also fans of the film yeah enjoy all the little behind the scenes bits which is nice lots of behind the scenes there was stuff i i learned in the documentary that i had no idea about because um what's yeah, what's was... one thing that you didn't well know? um like the 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 in-camera effects being, you know, uh, about Doug Henning coming in to help, um, the the possibility that maybe Matt, uh, who played older Jeff, was going to do the voice at one point, and all of the challenges they had to try and, you know, figure out Max's voice, and um, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, those are, those are a couple. <laughs> Awesome. So the, obviously the documentary all spurs from the Flight the Navigator. So tell us about your audition process and being a child star and coming up through Flight the Navigator and how it all come into your life. Well, I, uh, I started acting when I was younger, about eight in plays, and then I got in commercials and had my first feature when I was 10, a uh, Michael Crichton movie called Runaway, our robotic spiders, and, and Tom Selleck and Gene Simmons uh, uh, were the, yeah, the good and the bad guy. Anyway, and um, and then I uh, well I did some more stuff in between and and um, I guess one of the casting directors or someone had seen me in a Disney after school special called I Man. It was an indestructible man, uh, Scott Bakula from Quantum Leap and nice. and Star Trek. Uh, since there he so um, and uh, and I auditioned for Navigator and then uh, I remember. What I remember most was being, uh, you know, they flew my mom and I down to L.A. for a, for like a callback, a screen test, and that's when I first met Randall uh, for the first time, and and um, that was another neat thing was the little clip that I didn't even know was around from my original audition. Uh, it's in the documentary, and and I saw this little audition, and I remember <laughs> actually being in that room. I was like, oh, I remember that shirt, and. And stuff, but I remember doing this uh, this this callback, and we really uh, we really connected, and that and that carried out through through the movie as well, yeah. and and then finding out also how many other kids and and some pretty pretty famous ones now, Joaquin Phoenix and Chris O'Donnell. I you guess you can both. see Chris O'Donnell's audition in the video as well, and it's pretty right. funny because then you see you do it afterwards, and you're like, I know why Joey got the part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. So, I mean, you said yesterday you get nervous now auditioning. 
So was it nerve-wracking watching yourself back as a kid auditioning, or were you quite happy to see yourself auditioning back then? No, it was, it was neat. I think it was a reminder uh, almost to me now as an adult getting back into film and, get, and, and doing these auditions is to kind of just trust my gut and, mm. uh, and, and, and really follow, follow your heart or what, like, kind of, as a kid, I didn't overthink stuff, I, I yeah. don't think. I was, um, my mom was always wonderful in just supporting me, doing something that could lead to something, but it didn't have to. There was no pressure. I would come in to auditions with, you know, dirt on my knees and straight off the <laughs> playground, and I think that was one of the reasons why I had success was because I just went in and had fun, and I think that's uh, a good reminder yeah. as an adult is to just... Uh, to have fun and enjoy uh, what you're doing, whether no matter what it is, as long as it fills your heart. So being a kid on set for the, the first few times, what was it like exploring the sets and seeing it all work and all the behind the scenes like, and all the magic come together? I, I mean, I loved it. I grew up with musicals and plays and, and a lot of theater. We would go and see The Nutcracker every year and we would go and see university plays because my mom worked at the theater department there. and so. And she would do lighting for some plays and, and theater productions. So then I would be up there and see that. And it was always so fascinating to me. I, I loved it. Um, I mean, working on Runaway when I was 10, it was I, it, it, because there was all these robots. And back then, it was before CGI. And it was all practical effects. And they actually built these robots that would work for for. So, somewhat, somewhat, <laughs> um, right? Some of the, the spiders would scurry, or there was these drone cars that they, it, right? Basic remote control cars, and these crazy um, ones that were in the field with these little grinders on them. And um, so all of that behind the scenes stuff was really amazing to me, and I just loved it. And then with Navigator as well, uh, well, with, uh, with I. Clan of the Cave Bear had all this like makeup, you know, three and a half hours of full makeup and wig every morning. I Man was really cool. I got to do some of my own stunts and fall through a skylight and no, just the neat it. the way they use the candy glass and stuff. Like there was, you know, so then it didn't actually hurt you, but um, yeah, it, that was great. And all the props, of course, I was always like wanted to be best friends with these props guys because they had the <laughs> coolest stuff. Um, and uh, and Navigator uh, was just, I mean, it just kept going. I was so lucky. And all of the creatures, this isn't the or original, but the Puck Marin. And, and uh, I was talking about today one of my favorites, the yeah the big eye that would go. <laughs> and, uh, and Max, uh, you know, coming down the, the spaceship was on a big crane. We could actually get in it and all this stuff. So it was, I mean... Wonderful. So, I mean, obviously you got to work with Tim on set as well. So how did you two, when did you first meet and how did you two start gelling together and working together? Obviously, because Tim, you did the puppet work and the voice work and that. So tell us how you come on the set, Tim, and then obviously meeting Joey for the first time. I don't know. Joey was just very natural and and wanted to have fun. And so the scene with the puck mare, and we had to, it was uh, where he picked him up. It's a, it's a cable-operated puppet. So... The, the puppet had the cables came out of his back, I believe, and then went through his fingers, and he, I think he got taped to his arms so the camera couldn't see it. And you know, what Joey says is true. You just have fun, and he's this little creature, and I was able to provide the voice for him, and so it was like, what would a little creature sound like? And he was like. Well, he would speak a foreign tongue, an alien tongue, so it would be, and he's small, so I thought it would be. Listen, he's laughing. <laughs> so it's mainly with this, these kinds of things, it's to have fun, and then that translates and comes, comes through if you're having fun. So, and I don't know how you can not have fun puppeteering. If you're not having fun, I don't know why you're doing it. You know. So, um, Joe is again just um, a natural. Uh, just made you feel at home. He's just he was just great to work with. So, you did know. you um, feel okay, like 
acting towards uh, the puppet or did you kind of keep trying to look at Tim making the noise and the voices or did you eventually just fall for the puppet and go no, through? I, I, I mean, um, like you said, it was so neat because there was a, yeah, a thin cable kind of thing that would come out. So um, uh, it, when, when I was holding him, he would move in my hands and, and you, you could feel, even though it's, yes, we know practically that it's little gears inside and stuff, but with the, you know, the little voice happening and the, the and, and him moving in your hand, I mean, it was so easy to imagine that he was real. And plus, I, I just, I, it's something people have asked me and I just had a knack for really immersing myself in these, in the, in the world that I was put in, uh, right? I was I was David. I wasn't Joey acting. I was in this spaceship, and there was this stuff happening to me. It was, it was actually happening. So, yeah, I got to play with him, and I was, you know, I tickle him, and he'd move. And, I mean, it was, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it was it was absolutely real. <laughs> So uh, was there any challenging days for you two on set to work together? Did you find any particular scenes hard? Or was there, or what was your most favorite scene together you guys did? Well, I'm trying, so um, Tim's uh, partner, Tony Urbano, he, w he w uh, controlled Max. And yeah. so I had a lot more interactions with him and, and kind of, he would do, he did what they called the scratch track where he would read Max's lines and we would chat back together. And so we created more of a um, kind of relationship or as far as, uh, during the shooting, and um, uh, I mean, there was the one part where, uh, <laughs> the, when they were first getting used to the the, na the Max, you know, moving around on this trolley, and he comes up and goes, "You are the navigator." And uh, at first, it kind of <laughs> it kind of kept going. I had to scoot down in my seat, and I, you know, just just missed it. But um, yeah, and then uh, I know from also from the documentary that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Tony had to get in these awkward positions, and I, it was, I, I don't recall all that, because for me, I was just kind of sitting there, and, <laughs> and Max would come, and, and it would be wonderful, and, and then, yeah, you, you think back later, oh, if this poor guy's got to lie on this, the ground to kind of, you know, control <laughs> this thing, so, but, yeah. So, off the flight the Navigator, um, obviously, because um, you sort of went down a bit of a bad park, which inspired the documentary of Lisa Makers. Lisa, you're a director, editor and producer. So how did you discover Joey's backstory and first contact Joey and obviously get the ball rolling? Um, well, I first discovered, I guess, the he headlines. I didn't see the headlines when they first came out. So I had watched the film, um, having just done Life After Flash and while well, still in the process of it and trying to work out which film I want to do next. And obviously, Flight of the Navigator is a classic and I grew up with it. Um, and I think as everyone does, like you watch a film and you're like, I wonder what happened to this guy. And so you go down a rabbit hole of IMDb and Wikipedia and it was Wikipedia that I had seen like a couple of paragraphs of what had happened to him. Um, and you, I just didn't expect it. Um, and so then I had seen that he, according to Wikipedia, I was like, of course the internet's telling the truth. He must still be, you know, in jail if he, if it's, if it's right. So. I had just, it was quite a research process of contacting the correctional center because if you, apparently if like two years less a day, it's correctional, but if it's more than two years, it's federal. So I contacted the correctional center and they can't give you any details about him. They just have to, um, you need to give his, the person you want to contact their full name and a birth date and then send a message and hope that wherever in the country you might be, that the message would get to him. I can um, neither confirm nor deny that he <laughs> is here. <laughs> and then, and then, so I was like, well, I hope the internet is, because I was like, is that his real name? Um, hope the internet is <laughs> is right. And and then his mum called at like midnight, and this like sweet little voice going, hi, it's, I'll try not to be New York. Hi, it's Carol, and it's really, you know, Joey got your message, and he really wants to try and call you, and this is his address where you can write to him. And then we became pen pals for like six months, and then it was probably. Six months after he, you got out, that we met in person, and so we yeah. had a really nice relationship between. And that. I, on that, something that it reminded me of, uh, I remember reading my Wikipedia page one time, and I was like, "Wow, oh, that sounds really, really bad." That's <laughs> kind of, 
Um, and I, I always thought, well, some of it was kind of off, but I guess you can't edit a page yourself. It has to be someone else that I found. And, and, it, and there was no context to what had happened kind of thing. And so I thought, oh, well, that's too bad. And then yeah. connected with Lisa, and then it was this opportunity to, to share my story. And because and, um, that was one thing that I was uh, so appreciative of all the fans and that people still loved the movie after so long and that I had, uh, you know, let people down or let myself down and, and stuff. And so being able to provide this this platform to, to really share and, uh, yeah, and kind of, you know, not not excuse anything that I'd done, but just give a, a reason and yeah. kind of my my perspective of of how someone could go from A to Z or A and 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 kind of uh, and the journey in between. Um, that was one yeah. of the biggest things that I had wanted to come across is like it's so easy to see a headline, and I had I had done it too initially when I first read the Wikipedia, and you think, oh, it's you know another case of a child star going downhill and it's yeah. the product of Hollywood and what a shame and you just kind of shrug it off as oh it's another child star and then you go well there has to be some reason that it's like Cliff says in the documentary you like it's n not just a story about a kid actor that goes to jail it's about like what happened what happened from him being this kid on set to yeah. robbing a bank and so I think it's so easy now to just instantly judge a headline and go oh it's you know he's, he's obviously kind of lost the plot or um, but it's you know there's a human behind there and it's like what are the what's the context and why it happened and so yeah. I, that was really important for me to, to um, get across. Uh, this weekend I've met a few people that I've never met before that we've known each other on social media for so long but it's just been that instant gel we've known each other for so long even though we've never met was that the same way with you two when you first met was it just like old friends reunited or was it still that Oh my God! This is Joey from Flight the Navigator for you, or were you just were I, you I think straight the, in? The letters <laughs> helped, but it's funny. So many people after meeting Joey at a Comic Con come up to me and they're like, "I feel like I've known Joey for like 20 years. He's so nice and friendly." And it's just, I think part of that is just Joey. Mm. But I think it was really nice. We had built that trust with the the writing letters back and forth, and then yeah. so when we met for the first time, it was like just a big old bear hug, and we just like kind of started chatting mid sentence and. You know, there was no like, hi, how are you? How was your journey? It was like, oh my God, I can't. So it was just really, was really nice. So how was uh, filming the documentary together and putting it all together and, and obviously discovering more of Joey's history and research? Well, the first, I don't know if anyone has seen the documentary. If you haven't, it's called Life After the Navigator and it's available on Amazon. Um, it's really good. Thanks, thanks Tim. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. What was the question? No. Oh, the uh, putting it to, yeah, the putting it together. Um, the first interview, the four-hour interview, um, well, it was four hours, the, the scene where he's in, like, the NASA jumper. That was the first interview we did, and it was, like, the first day, I think, yeah. or the second day that we had met, and it really was, I don't know if it was just all these emotions had been building up, and it was almost cathartic, but we Absolutely. just kind of let the camera roll, and... It just it kind of all came out and so I think from there there was because we had such a trust as well yeah. um, it was quite easy to just kind of get into the heart of the story and then it was trying to work out what elements of the story whilst all really important to Joey's story as a whole as a documentary what can still show where he's gone and where he's headed um, without missing parts but you know it's hard to fit all of that into 90 minutes and then have the making of the film as well so it was it was challenging but we sh I shared links and Joey would comment and have input and make sure that you know his story was told the way that he wanted it to be told awesome. which was obviously very important to me so what was it like for you Tim seeing the documentary last night did you see behind the scenes footage you'd never seen or did it bring back memories for being on set for you well the the, the main thing for for me is just Joey's journey it, it reminded me I'd seen it before but it reminded me again what he what he went through and I have massive respect for him for for you know not succumbing and uh, it and actually I was we, we, we both were sitting there watching and I'm thinking to myself is this this must be really painful for him to, to sit through it and you know so I I just feel blessed to be part of, had to have been part of it, and and contributed, and um, 
it's, it's sort of surreal just sitting here talking to people who watched the movie and loved it, and it. I'm just grateful. Totally, that because I, I have people come and say how surreal it is to to meet you know, me after watching for so many years or see, you know, and loving the film. And I, I, it's, it's the same for me because I wouldn't be here without all of you uh, and, and, and the movie wouldn't have lasted this long without the yeah, fans. And, and, and then I wouldn't have this opportunity to come and, and, um, and travel and meet people and just, and, uh, and share the love of filmmaking and stuff. And, and from, from my side, cause I have, I've met some people at comic cons where I'm like, Oh my God! It's right. Uh, uh, oh yes, I'm loving this, and and so I I know what it's like to be a fan as well, and and that's why I'm so so grateful for to be able to come and do this. Awesome, brilliant. So um, we've got lots of people here today, sure, loads yeah. of people. So should we open up the floor to anyone here who wants to ask questions? Because I know we've got some people who definitely want to speak to you guys. So it's over to you guys now. So any questions from anyone? It's uh, I, it's always surprising to to see how uh, much people love the film, I guess, and and just that that it's like it just lights lights up like, and I, I it's like we're all we're all kids again, you know. We get to get to remember that and and be that. So um, and I love the questions. Sometimes it's like, oh, did you really like? I've had some obscure questions, you know. Did I actually get to? time travel and, and fly and stuff from like little kids or whatever and stuff and and it's great or you, you, um but i i uh yeah i just i i love it it's i don't i don't know if that quite answered but i just uh um it's always uh i'm just so uh, yeah it's great it's great sorry <laughs> thanks Ooh, uh, next question anyone sure Well, I, I had an opportunity to show Flight of the Navigator to a group of young actors that, uh, that my acting coach uh, was training. She had it. And um, uh, what I said to them was um, always make sure that you're having fun, right? Uh, if it starts to become stressful or a chore or you're not enjoying yourself, then take a break. It doesn't mean you have to stop, but je definitely uh remember to be a kid and and i think for myself i i do get the question would i change anything would i go back would i um do i wish i did things differently and and there's always those those thoughts and and what what ifs uh although i think that if it took all of the life experience all of the good all of the bad that that, that brought me here uh sitting with you and everyone and and being able to it's worth it, and, and I wouldn't change anything. Um, there are, there are, and we can't, right? We can all, unless we get a Trimaxian drone ship, then maybe we could go back. But would things change? I don't know. Would they turn out the same? I mean, we never, we'll never know. So, um, but I think that uh, uh, for anyone or for myself, it's just um, follow your heart and, and be, and like, it's okay to be you and trust your gut and follow what feels right for you, even if maybe um, other people don't, you know, want you to be something different. Um, yeah. Took a while for me to learn that, but hi. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe some school in between uh, scenes, because right? I did have to maintain that as well. Uh, but um, I, you know, it was uh, um, 
it was pretty fun. They were really good when I did do three months of filming in Florida and a month in Norway. And by that time I did, I missed my friends. It was the longest shoot I had ever been on. Um, and uh, But they flew a friend of mine and his dad over to visit with me in, in Norway. We shot all the interior spaceship in Norway. And you can find out more about that in Life After the Navigator. <laughs> We've got Blu-rays, and it's also on Amazon. But yeah, it's so. Um, uh, but it, and so they really, you know, it it was like a big family on set. I remember everyone, the props guy. I loved the sound. You know, Jonathan Sanger, producer, uh, Randall, the other cast. Maybe Albie, my little brother. He was uh, quite quite a stinker. He was really he was like that little. <laughs> So, but uh, we get along now, which is great. So, um, but uh, yeah, I think, um, and I was also by then still fascinated at oh how they set up the camera, and I loved uh, oh what kind of lens are you using, and how wide is that, and all that stuff. So I was really I was really into all all the filmmaking aspects. Any more questions? Well, uh, in short circuit was the biggest at you know at that point. They came back to back, uh, and I was you know working for Tony Urbano, who was hired by John Badham for to bring Number Five alive during the that shoot, and then I think the producers of that movie were sort of the, this one was happening, and they said, well, we Tony was like considered well just go right. They did a great job on short circuit. We'll get him on on this one. Um, and I think that's partly why it happened was because it was there were some connections there. Uh, and so for me, uh, it was like, I'm just starstruck myself. I, it, it, I was an accidental puppeteer, I call myself, because there are two types of puppeteers. You're either bit by the bug when you're a little kid and you just start making stuff yourself. You're, that's it. You're, that's what you want to do the rest of your life. And I was studying art in college and didn't know what I wanted to do and found an interesting summer job at this puppet studio. And it was Tony Urbano's puppet studio. And after that, my life was completely different. And um, as far as the, the, the creatures, um, we didn't really have a, a hand in, in creating them. They, I think they were all designed by uh, Ed Eith and then they um, were built by uh, a gentleman of, by the name of Lane Liska, and also Max was was the, I think the most complicated, you know, puppet on the whole set because it was, you know, suspended from, you know, those two trolleys and it was this metal thing, and I think Tony uh, was built by design setters who I believe built the spaceship interior, and so he went out and consulted with them on how to how it would be made and then how we would operate it. But we had nothing to do with building them. Um, and then while Tony was in Florida doing exteriors, um, he was there because there were um, exteriors with the spaceship and, and Max had to appear in the doorway. Um, and that, it, by, interestingly, that was a marionette that was um, operated by Tony inside the spaceship with strings. Yeah. It was a very lightweight version of, of Max. Um, as light as, I think, the you know, the light bulb part with the, the, the actual puppet inside the um, spaceship was quite heavy. But this marionette version had to be light enough that he could control it while he's just inside the ship. Hey, Blimpo, oink, oink, too many Twinkies. <laughs> um, so he was in, out doing exteriors in Florida, and I was left behind in Los Angeles to kind of consult with Lane Liska, who was building all the creatures. And I remember visiting Lane's workshop, and everything was in pieces. And said, well, when you get something together, I can help, you know, design the controls or help with the controls. And then I, then I went like two or three times, and the last time they were all put together and all painted. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I think they were shipped over to Norway, and there was some adjusting to do, and we assembled everything. Um, we had some uh, puppet builders who helped us do that. Um, 
but as, as far as like, you know, there, the, I would say Men in Black was also a very, you know, high end experience as far as puppets working with Rick Baker's studio. Um, but this one, we had a lot of, uh, when we were on, on set and installing the creatures in the lab, that was kind of left with us and I think one other puppet technician. So we had a hand in, in you know, we, the, the creature that's in the mist, he's a marionette. Um, there are strings there, there the, the, like a spiny or spindly creature. Um, it was um, really cool and very, again, surreal to be in Norway on a sound stage doing, doing this film. Um, Freezing cold. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question, but... I learned a lot there. <laughs> I was like, that was rad. Thank you. Cool. So, uh, next question. I think for, for David, um, part of the reason, and again, in the documentary, uh, hearing from Valerie Marsalis, the casting director, like they really wanted someone who was just natural, kind of no uh, formal training or anything like that. And, and that's uh, something that I just, I just had. And so um, I would learn the lines and then imagine I was there and, and just have fun with it. And I think... Um, Again, I immersed myself in this in this world and what was happening, and so uh, I never felt like there was uh, there was those rigid guidelines. That Randall was always very if he needed something specific, it was like, oh, this is what we're trying to do. Or, or right, um, the emotional scenes were tough, but he really was supportive in that. Like, hey, how right what? What can we do? I remember the very first scene where it's like, you know, where's my mom and dad? I, w I was missing my friends at the time, and he said, you know, is there something that that uh, that you can think of that's that's okay and that we can, you know? And I and I said, well, I, I miss my friends, and he's like, let's okay, let's. And then uh, afterwards, I was still upset, and he was like, but he was there for me, and 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 it was great. So that was something where I just. I just had fun with it, and I was I was David, and I just went for it. And um, there's some technical things like oh, in this scene we more like blocking stuff. So you've got to block out the scene, and oh, you walk to here and you do that, and 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 uh, and then this happens, um, reacting to stuff going through the forest, and right oh, there's going to be a noise over here, and kind of uh, those kinds of things. But as far as who David was, I just um, learned the lines and and had fun with it. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, Max and the creatures, I think it was the um, where y you do your your best version, and you do bring what you you know or you feel about it, and because that's going to come off as a more authentically. And Randall is a smart enough director to know that he can't force something that you know unless you're completely wrong for the part or you're doing it completely wrong, then sometimes that happens and then you s swap out somebody. But he was liking what we were doing. Um, I want to give a shout out to, to Tony because I think Max, I look back at, at that performance and it's not, it, there's not much that he can do, right? He's just an arm, kind of like this ball of eye on an arm. And um, I think the way that they coordinated, the, it was like chore, choreographed and coordinated, besides that one time where Joey almost got smashed in the face, um, with the two Norwegian grips working the trolleys to, to hit marks. But I think it's really effective performance with minimal action that you can do. And then he loosened up when he, with the, after the brain transfer, and then you got, he, he, it, there was a change. And That's even it, Davey. With, even with the limited, what, what Max could do was pretty darn limited. Um, he, he came across. So I think Tony did a 
fantastic job with with um, a limited uh, palette, so to speak. Um, Whoa, I can't believe mm -hmm. this is happening. <laughs> well, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. Beautiful Stephanie. <laughs> mm. <laughs> nice software. Sure, and uh, one last question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for watching it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was most conscious that I wanted to do better than I did for Life After Flash, um, because one of the... the most common comments I had was um, just the way it had kind of flowed from the making of to Sam's story. So I was like, I still want to do the same format, but um, better. So I was just in the edit extra conscious of trying to weave those narratives together. And I was very lucky um, that Randall, who obviously directed Navigator, um, kind of emailed and said, you know what, I'm happy to, like, if you send me a link, I'll, if you want my comments, or I was like, yes, of course please do like any notes you had. And so he was very helpful in helping me kind of weave the stories through and how to um, relook at the opening for, from an audience point of view. And so he was very, very helpful in that respect. Um, it's always hard when, because I obviously love Flight of the Navigator, and so there were so many little kind of tidbits of the makings of, and I wanted to include everything, but I was conscious that it was still a 90-minute film. So my backup was... Um, well, if it's not going to be in the documentary, I'll just put it as a bonus feature. I'll just, you know, put it as a bonus feature so I could kind of mentally help myself not, like I'm attached to all these different stories. So that was my way of still feeling like I could include them without including them in the 90 minutes. And then in terms of what to include from Joey's story, it really was just putting all the different themes and time, like a timeline on little pieces of cardboard and just like lining them all up and trying to work out what's important for this narrative and this narrative and for that part of his life that he was going through and um, what can the audience learn from this. And so it really was like just trial and error and then having a three hour cut and then a two hour cut and then an hour and 45 cut and just kind of and, weaning it down. And a huge tip of the hat to Lisa because we shot almost 24 hours of, of it was footage. A, it was I, a lot. And, uh, you know, I talked forever and ever and ever. And, uh, you know, I, um, so it, was, uh, it yeah. was really, really well done. I'm super proud and really grateful. And if you haven't seen it, see it because... Uh, and um, if you pick the up the Blu-ray, you can see those bonus features that I didn't include in yeah, the main the one that I didn't want to let go. Actually, <laughs> they're really great. They're so cool. Fun, fun, fun. So, um, yeah, yeah, really wonderful. Did you got the you got the Blu-ray disc with you today on your stool, haven't you? I have all? the Blu-rays. They're so. region-free, and there's over <laughs> 80 minutes of bonus features available downstairs. There you are. Perfect. Very well, it comes I'll, with a collector's patch. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'll sign them for you. Yeah. All worth it. Awesome. So on that note, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you talking to me and talking to... And thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Amazing.